a while back, a lady was driving down Interstate 75 outside of Gainesville, Florida. She was in the car with her kids and they were driving along and suddenly her tire blew. And then trying to control the car after the tire blew, she wound up crashing on the side of the road. She was stuck. She wasn't going anywhere. Well, it turned out that a man saw the crash and he pulled over right away and he wanted to check on him. He wanted to make sure everybody was okay and if they needed help. And so they called help and he stayed with them. He hung out with them until the deputies got there. And when the deputies came, he made sure again they were okay and then he wound up leaving. Well, because of who the man was, it got a little bit of news in the Gainesville area. And there was a headline, the Gainesville Sun, that said, Shaq, the Good Samaritan. When all seven foot one of Shaquille O'Neal stops alongside the road, it gets people's attention. And because he stopped and because he checked on them, he was what we call a Good Samaritan. A good Samaritan is a phrase that we use today to mean someone who is generous, someone who is heroic, courageous even in helping meet the needs of other people. That phrase, good Samaritan, you see it often in the news. I was just scanning some headlines and came across these. Good Samaritan gives first aid to injured girl. Boy falls through ice and rescued by good Samaritan. Good Samaritan goes viral for helping others during traffic jam. We refer to people as Good Samaritans, but there's also institutions that care for people that use that name. Good Samaritan hospitals or Good Samaritan adoptive agencies. In fact, one of the ministries that we partner with that is incredible at disaster relief is called Samaritan's Purse. Many of you have been part of that. We use that phrase, and it's so common today because of the incredible genius in storytelling of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus told the story, he told a parable of the Good Samaritan that we're going to look at today. If you read it, it will take you probably about a minute to read it. But it is so full of power, it is so full of meaning that it continues on and on some 2,000 years later to give us a picture of what it means to courageously care for someone else. And sometimes when people hear stories of Good Samaritans or hear this parable, they're challenged. They think, man, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. I want to make a difference. Sometimes people are inspired. But then sometimes we're convicted, aren't we? Sometimes we feel guilty. Oh, man, I don't live a life that way. My friends, we live in a world that is desperate for kindness we live in a world that is desperate for people to step up in the same way the Good Samaritan did. And so you may be very familiar with the story or maybe it's new to you today. But I want you to know as we look at it with fresh eyes, with fresh ears, with a fresh heart, God has a word for you and God has a word for me. He truly can take us as a body, as a family and help us to be world changers for him. So I know the Lord has a word for you today because he has a word for me today. And I want us to frame this story maybe in a different way. The way we're gonna look at this story today is we're gonna look at it as three men in a ditch. Three specific men in the story. We find the story in Luke chapter number 10. And as we begin you're going to first of all see the first man in the story. The first man in the story was in a ditch and he did not know he was in it. The first man was in the ditch and he did not know it. So let's pick it up and meet this man in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer that he's talking about is not a criminal attorney. He's not a civil attorney. This is a religious lawyer. Some of your translations may say, say an expert in the law. This expert in the law stands up and look what his motivation was. He says to put Jesus to the test. He didn't want to have a conversation with Jesus. He wanted to test Jesus. It's interesting. We talk a lot about cancel culture today. It's not anything new. 
It's not anything new. Thousands of years ago, they were trying to corner Jesus in, a, in order to cancel Jesus. And so he asks them this profound question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do so I know I'm going to be in heaven forever? He asks an important question that we should all ask, but he has an ulterior motive. He wants to put Jesus down. He wants to trick Jesus. But Jesus Christ is so wise, and I know some of you do this sometimes, when he's asked a question, he answers it with a question. Verse 26, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Remember, he's an expert in the law. This lawyer quoted back a couple passages of scripture to him from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. Verse 27, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. He comes right back to him and he says, well, this is the law in summary. He says, we're to love God with all that we have and we're to love our neighbor as ourself. He's an expert in the law. In fact, he's counting on the law. In his mind, the way to salvation, the way to God was to, 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 to fulfill the law. That was what he was seeking to do and seeking to live by that. But Jesus Christ is going to reveal to him. He's going to expose him. That's not going to make it. Because in verse 28, Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. His implication is you're not doing this perfectly. So in other words, you need to do this perfectly and you will live. If you're counting on the law as your way to life, then you need to do it perfectly. Well, even... That lawyer, even in his pride, he knew that he could not fulfill the law perfectly. So he wanted to be able to get some help. He wanted to be able to shade this a little bit. And we see in verse 29. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He wants to justify himself. He wants to prove himself right. And so he asks this question. I like the message translation. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? He's counting the law. He realizes he can't fulfill it perfectly. So now he's looking for the loophole with Jesus. He's saying, okay, well, what does it mean to truly love my neighbor? How would you define that? What he's basically asking Jesus to do is to put a circle around a certain group of people and say, okay, your neighbor is your fellow religious leaders. Okay, I can do that. Or your neighbor is fellow Jews. Oh, I can do that. Oh, your neighbor is people who are Gentiles. No, I don't want to do that. In other words, what he wants Jesus to do is he wants Jesus to limit the definition of neighbor. He wants him to make it safe for him. See, Jesus Christ is coming and he's using these parables to teach the values of the kingdom. He's using these parables to say, this is what it means to live now. And when he does this, he's turning the world upside down. Remember, this first man, this lawyer, he's in a ditch and he doesn't know he's in a ditch. Because as far as he's concerned, he has status in the culture. He has success. He probably has financial provision. He thinks, I'm good. And he wants to trick Jesus out of pride He wants to justify himself. In other words, he's counting on himself. He's counting on his position. And he's also seeking to define love with limits. Love is just this group of people just doing this kind of thing. He's in a ditch and he doesn't realize it. Many of us can get stuck in the ditch of self-reliance, friends. Many of us can get stuck in the ditch of self-justification. Hey, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Look at me. You may not say it out loud, but that's what we think of. We can be stuck in a ditch and not even know it. But Jesus, as I said, he's turning the world upside down. And so he replies to him, verse 30. Jesus replied and said to him, to the question, who is your neighbor? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. The second man in our story is in the ditch 
And he absolutely knows it. He knows it. He's gone on this journey. And it's so interesting the vivid detail that Jesus puts into this story. See, he could have just said this man was walking on any road. But he talked about the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Interesting Jerusalem is way above sea level. Jericho is below sea level. So it's about a 3,000 foot descent over 17 miles to go from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a steep road. It's a winding road. It's a road where many robbers could camp out. And that happened often in that day. Many times it happened. In fact, they would even have the nickname for a spot on that road. They called it the Pass of Blood. Because so much violence happened. Jesus tells this story about this man on a road that they would have been familiar with. And all of a sudden he's jumped. He's beaten. He's stripped. Everything's taken from him. He's in the ditch and he's left for half dead. This man is in the ditch and he knows that he's in desperate need. He's in desperate need. And when you're in desperate need, what can you do? You just hope. He was beyond capable He did not know that that he didn't have the capacity to get himself up or out. So what could he do? He could just hope that help would come. And Jesus describes potentially what could have happened. And by chance, verse 31, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, notice he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the priest comes along and he sees this man in desperate need. And he passes on by. The religious leader. He probably had been serving in the temple. Priests very often lived in Jericho. They would do a two week stint. And then they would go back home. Maybe he was going back home. How could he have passed on by? Ken Bailey is a Middle Eastern scholar. And he writes this. He says the priest cannot approach closer than six feet to a dead man without being defiled. And he will have to overstep that boundary just to ascertain the condition of the wounded man. The process of restoring ritual purity was time-consuming and costly. It required finding, buying, and reducing a red heifer to ashes. And the ritual took a full week. Thus, it is easy to understand the priest's predicament as he suddenly comes upon an unconscious man beside the road. He's coming along. He sees the man and all that man represented to him was probably complexity all that man represented was he could have made him ritually impure and so he passed on by but he wasn't the only one to come by to this man who knew that he was in the ditch and knew that he was in need verse 32 likewise a Levite also when he came to the place and saw him remember he saw him he passed by on the other side so the priest goes by then the Levite the Levites were the assistants to the priest they, ha- they handled a lot of the different operations around the temple. And so in the same way, the Levite also, religious leader, passed him by. Now we don't know, again, why he passed him by. Maybe he saw the priest ahead and he realized, oh, okay, he passed him by. That's the wise thing to do. Don't ever underestimate the power of your influence. Parents, we can't ever, ever, ever underestimate the power of our influence to our kids. What we do, they do. And maybe the priest made his choice. The Levite said, I don't want to show him up. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pass him by. Or maybe he was just worried because there were so many robbers that were on the road. Maybe he thought they're still there. They could be lurking. Maybe he thought it's a setup. Maybe he think the guy's not really really broken and beaten maybe this is just a setup to get me whatever motivated him we don't know but he also chose to pass him by he's in a ditch and he knows he needs help but so far help has just passed him by what is he going to do and then Jesus continues the story and I'm imagining that he's already gotten under the lawyer's skin a little bit the lawyer who thought he had it all together because the religious leaders, people just like him, they were the ones that passed this man in need by. And as Jesus continues the story, we see the story of the third man. And the third man willingly went 
into the ditch. The first two were there. One didn't know it. One knew it, but was desperate. But the third man, he willingly went into the ditch. Who is this third man? Verse 33. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. When he saw him, he felt compassion. Now, when we see that, we go, that's right. The good Samaritan is the one that stopped. The good Samaritan is the hero. The good Samaritan is the one that cares. But what Jesus did right there, right then, in that moment, is he dropped a truth bomb that maybe we need to understand a little bit better. Because when Jesus chose the hero of the story to be a Samaritan, he chose the sworn enemy to a Jew. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. Little biblical background. You may know the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. When Jesus had this conversation with her, first thing she said to him was, why are you talking to me? Because you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. In Luke chapter 9, one chapter before the story that we're looking at, Jesus had been traveling with his disciples. And he sent some messengers ahead to a Samaritan village. And he said, hey, book some accommodations for us so we can stay there tonight. But when the Samaritans found out that it was for a Jew, they rejected him. They said, no way. And that's the moment in Scripture where James and John said to Jesus, hey, do you want us to call fire down upon them? That's where they got the nickname, the Sons of Thunder. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. And then Jesus, as he is telling us this new kingdom, what this new kingdom looked like, he drops the Samaritan in as the hero of the story. He was blowing away any kind of sense of boundaries of people. What he was saying in that moment, in this kingdom of God, in my kingdom, every person is valuable. Every person is an image bearer of me. Every person can potentially be part of my family. He's communicating so much richness and depth in this picture. And he gives us a Samaritan. And he says the Samaritan felt compassion. He felt compassion for him. Compassion is such a strong biblical word. We see it referenced to Jesus in multiple times. Jesus saw the crowds and he felt compassion for them. Jesus saw them and they were like sheep without a shepherd. He felt compassion for them. How do we define compassion? Compassion means to be deeply moved. To be affected deeply in one's inner being. Compassion is not just pleasant thoughts or good intentions. Compassion means that our hearts are involved. We're deeply moved. It's like you feel it in your gut. That's a literal translation. You feel it in your gut. When he passed by and saw this man need, he felt compassion. Verse 34. And so he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Jesus gives us a picture of compassion in action. It's amazing. First of all, it starts with the eyes. We notice that the priest saw, that the Levite saw, and then the Samaritan saw. It started with the eyes. He was looking. But different from the priest and the Levite for the Samaritan, it went from his eyes to his heart. Compassion. He was deeply moved. And because he was deeply moved, compassion is action. Then it went from his eyes to his heart to his hands. He got down, he got down in the ditch. Remember the priest and Levite, they were standing back. They didn't want to touch him. The Samaritan dove right in there. He didn't care if he got his hands bloody, his clothes bloody. He cared for him. What did he do? It says he took out his oil and his wine. The wine was a disinfectant. The oil was a curative. He cared for him. And then he lifted him up. And it says, then he put him on his own beast. He put him on his own donkey, which meant that he'd have to walk. He put this stranger who was broken and beaten on his donkey, and then he carried him 
to the inn, to the innkeeper. You see compassion in action from the eyes to the heart to the hands, even to the wallet. Because he said to the innkeeper, here's a couple denarii, here's a couple coins to cover his stay. But I'm going to come back if there's anything more. He goes, I will cover it. Because I don't want him to go into debt. Because if someone went into debt and they could not pay it, then they could go into jail. Jesus completed the full picture of compassion. Compassion starts in the eyes. It goes to the heart. And then from the heart to the hands, even the hands to the wallet. In other words, compassion is we see a need. We care, we care about it and we do something about it. Not just good intentions. Not just, oh, that breaks my heart, oh, I'm so, that's so sad. But we care and we do something about it. That's what Jesus says, the value of the kingdom is to care and to get into action and make a difference. I remember many, many years ago going on a mission trip to Brazil with some good friends. A really good friend of mine went, went with us. We'll call him Mark Poe because that's his name. And uh, it, was, it was awesome, we both say, for the two of us and the group we went. And, and it was incredible. Every day we got to go out and share Christ with people and, and see people come to know the Lord and care for people and love people. And when the trip was over, we were tired. And it turned out that our flight home was an overnight flight. And so we were going to get on the plane and we truly were going to be able just to go to sleep. And normally I don't sleep well on planes, but I could tell I was so tired I was going to sleep on this flight. And so Mark and I were sitting there and then a couple seats over was a lady who'd gone with us on the trip. She had a couple teenagers. They'd come with us. And anyway, she's a great, great lady. And so we're all settling down. Plane is in the air. And I could tell, all right, it's about time to conk out. And just about the time... I'm ready to go out to sleep. This child begins to cry. Not just a little whimper, but just a real, real intense cry and continues to cry. And my friend, a couple seats over, she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm gonna go check and see if I can help out. And so she just slipped away and went and somewhere down the, the, the next aisle. And soon after that, I fell asleep. And I was sleeping and maybe a couple hours later I woke up. And I woke up and I noticed that her seat was still empty. And I thought, man, what is going on? Something must be happening. And I went back to sleep again. And then finally, when the plane was getting ready to land, you get the, you know, put your tray tables up, your seat backs up, all that. I woke up and I was like, all right, you know, time, time, we're here. I can't believe it. And I looked over and my friend is just coming back to her seat. And I said, man, have you been up all night long? And she said, yeah, 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 I have. The child was really sick and the mom needed help. And I was like, that is unbelievable. I I was so encouraged by her true compassion, by her true compassion. I said, I cannot believe that you did that. And she was just being humble and she just said, you know what? That's what what one mom does for another mom. And I thought to myself, I'm glad I'm not a mom. (laughs) You get the picture, don't you? See, in my mind, we'd been on this amazing trip. I just checked the box, you know? I was, and I really did care. I really did care. But I can't imagine the level of care she demonstrated. And she did, and that mom was in need. And she helped that mom all the way through that flight it was supernatural it was the picture of the kingdom of God in action she didn't know this mom she probably never would see her again but she saw a need she saw a need it touched her heart and from her heart to her hands and she made a difference and so Jesus he paints this picture to this lawyer who says hey what do I what can I do to inherit eternal life and then he says well Fill the law completely. And he says, well, what does it mean to love my neighbor? And then Jesus just blew up the definition for a neighbor to him. And this is how he ends it. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. 
Go and do the same. See, remember this first guy, we said he's in a ditch and he doesn't know it. And he still doesn't know he's in the ditch. Because how did he refer to the one? How did he refer to the Samaritan? He called him the one. He couldn't even mention that name. He couldn't even say, in this kingdom of God, there's a place for everyone to serve and make a difference when they know you. No, he still was holding on to power. And Jesus humbled him. He humbled him. Did he get it? We don't know. We don't know. That's the end of this part of the story. So when you look at this story, where do you find yourself? Where do we find ourselves today? For many of us, we may be the one that's stuck in the ditch. And we're living life on our own terms. And we don't even know it. Others know it. People see us. People experience our lack of love, our love with limits. They know it, but maybe we don't know it. But then there's plenty of us that are very aware that we have been in the ditch. Maybe that we're in the ditch right now. See, sometimes to be in the ditch is to suffer the consequences of something that we can't ever expect. It's something sudden. It's something that comes out of nowhere. And we have to pursue a path of life through that difficulty. But then very often the ditch is something of our own making. Maybe it's our own selfishness, our own sin that's put us there. But when you're in the ditch and you know you need help, that is a great place to be. Because it's in the ditch where most of us will finally look up. It's in our sin, it's in our selfishness that we finally go, I can't do this on my own. I need help. And Jesus Christ is the help. He is the Savior. See, in this multi-layered story, what Jesus is communicating is the answer to the lawyer's question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer is to realize we're the one in the ditch. And we can't make it out on our own. And we can't rely on anything but him. But when you come to know Jesus Christ, when you are rescued by him, then it puts us in the space and the place of compassion. Because once we realize that we have been rescued by him, then we want to give that rescue away. Man, you're looking for compassionate people? Just look around you. In our church family, I see compassion played out all the time. People who step up for others in need, they care. But you know what it's fueled by? It's fueled by their love that they have received from Jesus Christ. Because what does God's word tell us? That we love, we are compassionate because he first loved us. When we have received his compassion and we know it. When every day, friends, you realize I'm the one in the ditch. But God has rescued me. When you know you're rescued, you want to give it away. And, and, and people that have been humbled by the Lord give his kindness away. Our friend that I told you about, that wasn't just one instance. I could tell you story after story of her stepping up in kindness and compassion for people. Why? Because she knows she's been miraculously rescued by Jesus Christ. And she wants to give his love away. We love because he first loved us. And when you hear this story, it's not meant to be a guilt trip. It's not meant to go, oh, there's so much need out there. I don't know what to do. Let's just be simple. We love because he has first loved us. Start where you are. We trust the Holy Spirit as you're walking along. As that man, Samaritan, was walking along, he noticed a need. Start right where you are. Demonstrate compassion and love in the home that you live in, in the community that you live in. Give that away first. Give that away first. One person said this, the mark of true success is when the people that are the closest to you speak the best of you. The mark of true success is when people that are the closest to you speak the best of you. Give it away at home, who you live with, your friends. But then be aware, have eyes that see the world around you, that see the people that are hurting and make a difference. As God leads, make a difference. As we walk in the spirit, he will use you. We love because he first loved us. And as what did Jesus say? His last words 
to that lawyer were, go and do the same. We've experienced the compassion of Jesus. Let's love like him. Let's go and do the same.